So from one Emma to another, let me introduce you to the amazing Emma, Ho Emma Hopkins. She currently leads Spotify um, Creative Collective UK team, developing ideas worth listening to, to the, to the world's top brands and agencies. With a resume that looks like an iPhone screen prior to Spotify, Emma worked at Twitter and Snap where she also held creative roles. Some of her amazing accolades include being named British um, Business Insider's Top 30 Creatives. She's a Beamer um, Award winner and she judged at DNAD. So but without further ado, I'd love to pass you over to another Emma. Go for it, Emma. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about social class within the creative industry. Uh, class is a deeply contested term within Britain. Um, on one hand, it describes a set of classifications used by social researchers, and on the other, it's about an individual or a community sense of identity. As a result, it can be a pretty confusing term. I currently work at Spotify in the UK as creative lead. Uh, I didn't always live in London. I grew up in a village just outside of Bristol. Uh, as you can hear, I've somewhat lost the accent. Uh, the picture above is actually of me as a little child. Uh, the creative industry is rooted in connecting with people, and yet I didn't know a single person. I worked in a garden centre while studying to pay for cost of living, and I interned for free at eight different creative agencies. I romanticised the grind, but I had no safety net. In order to accept my first job in London, I had to take out a huge loan that I am still paying off for today. And once I got here, I realised that the industry is not set up for lower classes like I was to succeed. Now, it goes without saying that the conversation about classism magnifies immensely when we address its intersection with other identities, such as race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, disability and gender identity. People working within culture and making culture are not currently representative of the nation's demographics. Those added issues aside, we still have a problem. And the problem is that classism in the creative industry is an unfortunate reality and it, it excludes an entire league of talent, which therefore has the power to dilute the quality of work that the industry is producing. The Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre ran research that shows as of 2020, only 16% of the workforce in our industry are from working class backgrounds. On the flip side, 52% are from privileged backgrounds. Those from working class backgrounds experience less autonomy and control over the work that they do. They are less likely to have supervisory responsibility or to progress into managerial roles by almost 12%. Those from privileged backgrounds are dominating the key creative roles and they're responsible for shaping what goes on our stages, on our pages and on our screens. Despite the growing awareness of all of these issues, the stats have remained largely unchanged. In 2014, it was 17.6% of those working in creative roles that were working class origin. And today it's 16.2. So it's actually gone down and declined a little. I believe it's really important for our industry to look deeper and to hear more perspectives. So with this in mind, I asked three people who have come from working class backgrounds, but happen to have excelled in our industry to offer their experiences. Look at the lovely Louise pictured in the middle there, sleeping in her frilly bonnet. Lou is the marketing uh, director of Europe for Pinterest. However, she previously worked at an agency. The agency were pitching for a new client of which was a budget family holiday resort in the UK. The agency sent a company wide email asking employees if anyone had been there or had any experience there. There were only two people that had and Lou was one of them. One response said that the resort was simply for sunburnt men with their tops off, drinking beer and forgetting about their kids which was later presented as an insight. Needless to say, this brief provoked a string of working class judgment. When this agency pitched for the client, they lost in the most spectacular fashion. They had no clue about the brand, the, the experience, and they were rude about the potential audience. It was an offensive response and Lou was embarrassed for the agency. She said it was at this point, that having experienced this toxic situation, that made her come out as working class and no longer cover her background. And now on to Rack's story, pictured on the left. Such a cute photo. <laughs> Rack is the head of European sales for Spotify. And when I spoke to him, he told me about what he called the shades of Rack. He said that he got to a point where he was operating too many extreme versions of himself. He had his work persona, family, father, friend. But even within these personas, he found himself interacting differently. 
When he stopped and he thought about why he was doing that, he realized that he was covering. He was covering being from the North in Manchester, covering from his Indian ethnicity and covering his working class background. This was ever prominent when he would attend industry events like someone in Rex Roll would. I'm sure all of you today have been to one or another of those. When you have to cover a part of who you are, it can elevate the feeling of what am I doing here or imposter syndrome, as we all know. And to this day, Rex still admits feeling that way. As, as Rex progressed in his career, he could be more of his authentic self and he now holds the title of diversity, inclus inclusion and belonging lead at Spotify alongside his sales director title. And lastly, Jed, pictured on the right, if you attended a school in Britain, I'm sure you definitely have a similar photograph hiding in a shoebox somewhere. Um, you may have heard this week that Jed set up an initiative called Common People, of which I'm a proud to be a part of. It aims to make common people more common in the creative industry. He also leads the creative studio for IPG Media Brands. He told me that there are two big things he's noticed as someone from a working class background finding themselves in advertising, and they both relate to his first job. When he landed his first job, he thought he'd finally made it. It was his Everest, his peak, and on his £13,000 salary a year in Leeds, he could finally start living the high life. It wasn't to a year or so in that he realised that everyone else at his level saw their first job as the start of the ladder, not the end. This was a big shock to Jed, and it took a while to reset his ambitions. To this day, it is a process that he goes through with every job and every promotion. The second thing was that being from Leeds, everyone had really thick accents. So class distinctions were less obvious until that is that he pronounced something that he'd read but never heard said aloud. The one that he got ridiculed for the worst was Dauphinois potatoes, which he pronounced dolphin noise potatoes. The word was new to him. These might seem silly, but to Jed, it marked, out, marked him out as different, left out and quote, a bit thick. These things ultimately motivated him and today he makes sure that his working class voice is heard so that no one else feels daft about feeling like they've peaked when they get an entry level role or feeling daft because they've mispronounced something. I'd like to thank Rack, Louise and Jed for their stories today. The industry is a better place with them and their experiences. I think we can all agree the caliber of work in the industry will plateau unless we take actionable steps to make our field more inclusive for people from all socioeconomic backgrounds. To wrap up, I'd like you to consider and hopefully incorporate just three things that could open the door for people who have been locked out of our industry since its inception. The first is I'd love you to be mindful of the culture that your workplace is creating. Individuals from low income backgrounds can feel alienated in an environment in which financial privilege is the norm. Are your agency activities inclusive? Are you making efforts to understand everyone's experience? If you undergo a team activity or day out, are you expecting people to have the funds to pay? A question we should all ask ourselves, does your team reflect the demographic that your client is reaching out to? Secondly, let's start actively searching outside of the London bubble. There are undiscovered places, the undiscovered, undiscovered gems in places like Glasgow, Wales, Leeds, and the good news is they aren't rare. Uh, this year, we've seen a rise in companies introducing working remote policies, and I'm pleased to say it's something at Spotify that we have introduced. I'm hopeful that other agencies and organisations will also find the value in reaching outside of those major markets. And lastly, let's eliminate degree requirements. University offers a wealth of knowledge, valuable experience and access to the brains of advertising's top talent for those who can pay. Those who don't have the privilege of attending a university are starting 10 yards back in the race to top agencies from, the count from their counterparts that did. By el eliminating degree requirements, agencies can immediately broaden their potential talent pool. And just some closing thoughts from me. I want to be clear that just because someone is from a privileged um, financially family, that doesn't mean that they're a bad person. And the issue of class and classism won't be solved overnight. But by doing our best to level set the playing field for all of us, we can strengthen our industry. We can create more honest, meaningful work for our clients and become leaders in the change sector. I always hear that 99% of advertising in the world is rubbish, but I wonder if we make our industry more accommodating for people from poor socioeconomic backgrounds, would we be able to change that opinion? That's it for me today. Thank you so much for listening and please enjoy the rest of today's lineup.